there are a number of different interfaces that are used for communication within a computer system. And you might be familiar with things like PCI Express or with SATA, and both of these are actually serial data interfaces. Uh, but there's a lot of applications that don't require the speed and, and complexity of these types of interfaces, like you know, just communicating between different chips on a circuit board or communicating with uh, you know, an SD card through, through that interface um, or interfacing with, with other peripherals on, a, on a, like a smartphone, things like uh, touchscreen digitizers or uh, sensors like accelerometers and things like that. For example, I've got a data sheet here for it's a temperature, humidity, and pressure sensor. And it's, it's really just this little tiny um, device here, this little silver thing. And the way that it communicates with the rest of a, of a computer system is through uh, one of, uh, it actually supports two different protocols, either SPI or I squared C. And both of these are, are very common protocols for communicating between chips. The simpler of them is SPI, the serial peripheral interface. And that's what I'm gonna be talking about in this video. And SPI is, is a fairly straightforward protocol, which makes it quite flexible. So it's used for communicating between a peripheral device of some sort, hence the name serial peripheral interface or SPI. Um, such as like this temperature sensor, or this is actually a, a little accelerometer like you might find in a modern cell phone, or you know SD cards, displays, and things like that. Um, so SPI is used to communicate between any of these sorts of devices and some sort of microcontroller or microprocessor. So you know whether it's an ESP8266 like this, or an Arduino, or even just some low-cost microcontroller, or you know a full-blown uh, CPU-based system like this 6502 with all the um, associated I/O hardware. But whichever devices you're connecting to whichever controllers, the SPI interface is not symmetrical. So the controller is always gonna dictate everything about the communication with the device that it's connected to. Um, so sometimes you'll see the controller referred to as master and the device referred to as the slave. And so the interface itself between them is typically a four wire interface. You always have a clock and the clock signal is always generated by the controller. And then you've got two data signals, uh, one going in each direction. So one from the controller to the peripheral device, and then one from the peripheral device back to the controller in the other direction. And basically the way this interface works is that each time the controller or the master side toggles this clock signal, one bit gets sent in each direction. And that's roughly how this works. Um, and finally, there's a fourth wire, which is a chip select. And again, that is going from the uh, controller here over to the peripheral device. So that's a chip select. And that's an active low signal, so that needs to be pulled low before uh, any communication will take place. And there's actually no official standard for SPI, so you may see some different naming conventions for these pins. So for example, if we look at the data sheet for that, um, that temperature sensor, uh, it talks about those four pins. We've got um, CSB, chip select bar, is what that stands for. So that's you know, basically this chip select with a bar over it, so it's active low, as they, as they indicate here. Serial clock, SCK, we've got. And then for the data pins, they refer to it as SDI and SDO, serial data in, serial data out. So in this case, you know, that's the data sheet for the, the temperature sensor, which is this peripheral device. So this would be serial data in, and this would be serial data out from the perspective of the peripheral. So with that same naming convention, we would actually have to flip that around because on the microcontroller, uh, this is serial data out, and this is serial data in. Uh, so serial data out on the controller goes to serial data in on the peripheral device and, and vice versa. Another naming convention that you'll see quite commonly is to refer to this as MOSI, M-O-S-I, and this signal as MISO, M-I-S-O. And that actually refers to the, the signal on both ends. So on this end, it would also be MOSI and MISO. And that stands for master out slave in. So that's indicating that it's output on the master side or this controller side and slave in, meaning it's input on the peripheral side. And then MISO is master in, slave out. And so that's a common convention that you'll see because it has the advantage of being the same on both ends of the link. So for example, for this temperature sensor, we saw in the data sheet that it's, it uses the SDI, SDO uh, nomenclature to refer to its pins, but it's on this, um, it's on the circuit board that does some level shifting and stuff so that we can communicate with it using uh, five volt signals instead of 3.3 volt signals. But you can see the pins are labeled, uh, you know, chip select, MISO, serial clock, and MOSI, as well as, of course, power and ground here. But regardless of what they're called, for an SPI interface, those are the four signals that you're typically going to see. Although I guess I should mention that in some cases, <laughs> there might be a missing signal. So in this case here, we've got this LED display, and it has, um, of course, there's power and ground there, but then there's only three other pins. So there's the clock, as you would expect, there's chip select, and then there's data in, which I guess is sort of the same as serial data in or MOSI, whatever you want to call that. 
But there is no serial data out, there is no MISO, um, and that just happens to be because uh, this display, you can send data to it <laughs> for what you want to display, but it doesn't actually have an ability to send any data back to you because that's just not necessary for what it's doing. But anyhow, once we've got those signals, this is basically how it works. So we've got the controller, that master controlling the, the chip select and serial clock, as well as the, the MOSI master out data signal here. And the first thing that happens is chip select goes low. And then basically at each clock transition, from low to high in this case, the master is also able to send a bit. And then when, in this case, the clock transitions from high to low again, that bit on the data line uh, might change so that the next time the clock goes high, there's a different bit there. And then, you know, when the clock goes low, you change the bit again. When the clock goes high, <laughs> we sample that bit um, and so on. And, and that's how the, the master side of this uh, is able to transmit data by, you know, controlling this clock and then setting each bit that's, uh, that's being sent. But simultaneously, the device is able to send data back through the master in uh, slave out or, or MISO signal. So basically every time the controller sends a bit by toggling this clock and setting a bit there, the device also gets to send a bit that can be read by the controller. So if all the microcontroller wants to do is send data, then it can, you know, set chip select low, toggle the clock, and send its data out the MOSI line. And then it can just ignore the, the MISO line. Alternatively, if the controller wants to receive data from a device, then it can set chip select low, toggle this clock, you know, not send anything, just send all zeros or all ones or whatever, doesn't matter, uh, out, out of MOSI, and, and then just read on MISO to get whatever data the device is sending to it. So every clock pulse is, is able to send a bit in both directions. It just, depending on the situation, that bit might not mean anything if you only want to uh, transmit data in one direction. Uh, but in any case, at the end of the transmission, the chip suck line is pulled high again, to signal that, it, that it's done. And like I said, there is no spec for SPI, so uh, some of this definition is, is a little bit loose. Um, for, for example, there's no, there's no single rule about how this clock is actually interpreted. So here I'm showing the clock starting out low when, when the line is idle, and then using the uh, positive going transition to indicate when to sample each bit, and using the negative going transition as sort of the time where you flip from one bit to the next. But there are actually sort of four different ways that this could work. Like I just showed you, the clock could start out low, and then on the negative going transitions, it flips bits, and on the positive going transmissions is where we sample what the, what the bit is set to. We could also um, flip that phase around, so it would still start out low, but flip on the rising edge and then sample on the falling edge. Or the clock could default to being high and just flip the whole polarity around so that we're uh, you know, sampling on the falling edge or the clock could start out high and we could sample on the rising edge. And so which of these uh, things we're doing is sort of defined by both the, the polarity of the clock, whether it's, uh, you know, starts out high or starts out low, as well as the phase, you know, whether we're sampling on, on the rising or, or falling edge. And in order to know which to use, you'd have to look at the data sheet for the particular device that you're using. So in this case, for that temperature sensor, um, it tells us right here, it says the SPI interface is compatible with SPI mode zero. Um, which is polarity and phase are zero, and mode uh, one one, which would be uh, three in, in binary, with uh, polarity and phase equal to one. Um, and so basically, to kind of read into what that's saying, it's saying you know we can use either of these modes, which which really is is just saying that it's going to look it's going to sample on the rising edge because these are actually the two scenarios where it samples on the rising edge, um, and it's effectively saying like it doesn't really care what the clock is doing when the line is idle. It could be either low. Um, or it could be high, but either way, we're going to sample on the rising edge. So basically, you just need to check the data sheet for your particular device to see what it wants. And the last thing I want to mention is about the chip select uh, signal here. Uh, why, you know, why does that exist? And the reason is that we can actually connect lots of SPI devices together on the same uh, bus. And so if we have multiple devices like this, we can just connect all of the clocks together, uh, connect all of the, the MOSI signals together, and, and connect all of the MISO signals together. And so then all of these devices basically share the same three pins here, the, the clock, serial data in and out on our, on our microcontroller. And then you use this chip select to select which of the devices you're talking to. So you, so you do end up needing a separate chip select for each device. So we might need a, a chip select for this device here that goes back to the microcontroller and a chip select for this device that goes back to the, to the microcontroller. And so we've got three chip select signals coming out of our microcontroller but then we're able to share the clock and the two data lines uh, coming out of the microcontroller. And of course, these are inputs to these devices. 
And if you really have a lot of devices, you could use a decoder um, like this uh, you know, 74LS138, which has, um, in this case, three inputs uh, and eight outputs. And based on the value of the three inputs, you're going to get um, one and only one output at a time that's, that's set low. And so that would actually work uh, perfectly for this uh, active low chip select, where you want one and only one device selected at a time, and you could use three pins over on your microcontroller to control uh, potentially up to eight different uh, devices. And then, of course, share the clock and the two data lines. And so that's basically the physical interface for SPI. Now, as for what data is actually sent, that really totally depends on the particular device in question. It's going to define its own protocol for, for talking to it. So to understand that, we'll have to dig into the particular data sheet for that device. So as an example, let's uh, take a look at the data sheet for this little temperature sensor thing. And you know, to understand how to use SPI to communicate with, with this, you really got to just kind of read through this whole data sheet to uh, get an understanding of how it works overall. But I'll spare you the details. Um, basically, the way this uh, device works is it defines uh, a basic protocol for reading and writing a series of registers. And so here are the different registers that it defines. And some of them are pretty straightforward based on what the device does. You've got these uh, top two here. So this is humidity, uh, least significant byte, and then humidity, most significant byte. So those two together give you uh, 16 bytes of correction, 16 bits of humidity information. And then that's followed by temperature. So there's a temperature, least significant byte, and most significant byte. And then there's also this temperature X LSB. I don't know if it's extended or what, what that's supposed to mean, extra. Uh, but, but basically, you get 20 bits of temperature data. Um, and then these four bits here are always zeros. Uh, and then same for pressure. So there's uh, 20 bits of pressure data. So, you know, this device is, is <laughs> it's a humidity, temperature, and pressure sensor. And so here's how you read the humidity, temperature, and pressure out of it. So there's 16 bits of humidity, 20 bits of temperature, 20 bits of pressure. And each of these bytes uh, has a, a particular address associated with it. And you'll see that the protocol that it uses over SPI allows you to specify an address, and then you'll be able to read whatever is in that particular register and get the values from the sensor. There's also some configuration stuff. And so these are registers that we can actually write to to uh, you know, control how often these registers are updated. And there's some other settings for oversampling and filtering and averaging and things like that. Additionally, there's some uh, read-only registers in here for calibration data, because it turns out when you read this humidity, temperature, pressure data, you don't actually get the answer in a uh, unit that you <laughs> would be familiar with. You need to do some math based on this calibration data, which I guess during manufacturing they calibrated and then write some data into, into some ROMs or something that you can then read from here. But that's the basic interface, is that there's just a handful of registers that you can uh, either read or write from. And then when you get into the actual protocol for the SPI interface, they define you know, how, how to actually read or write from those registers. And so here's a timing diagram that should look very familiar. This is uh, just SPI. Uh, but what it's showing is that it's showing that you know, chip slip goes low, as we saw before, and then the clock comes in. And then on the rising edge, we're reading in this data. But what it's saying is that the first eight bits of data are going to come from the, the microcontroller. And the first bit is a read-write bit. So it's indicating whether we're reading or writing. So if we're writing data, that'll be a 0. For reading data, it'll be a 1. And then that's followed by seven bits of address. And that address corresponds back with the, uh, wherever it went, there it is, corresponds back with the address associated with the register that you want to either read or write from. So you send that. And then once you send that, you're either going to continue sending another eight bits of data that you want to write to that register, or if this was a this first bit was a one, you're reading, then you're going to expect to get those, uh, those eight bits back, which would be the value of, of whatever's in that register. So this is basically defining how it's using that SPI interface that we discussed to uh, you know, read and write from the registers. And so it gives some examples here for writing a couple bytes into a couple different registers. So this is showing uh, chip select being set to 0 and read write is 0, so we're, we're writing. And then the address of the register is sent. And then the data that we want to write to that register is sent. And then if we want to write to another register, we just follow it up with basically another copy of that command. So it's, uh, you know, we're writing. In this case, it's a different register. And then we would follow that with whatever data. And whenever we're done with all that writing, the chip select would be set back to 1. And then for reading, it's basically the same deal, um, or at least very similar, where we start out by setting chip select to 0. In this case, we're reading. So the read-write bit is set to 1. And then whatever register value we want to read from. So if we want to read the temperature, we would just put the address of, the, of you know, one of those temperature registers in there. And then on subsequent clock pulses, the device is going to send data back to the, the controller with whatever data is in that register. 
And the difference and what, what they're kind of calling out here is that there's this multiple byte read where it auto increments, where if you send it an address and then you read eight bits, you're going to get whatever data is in that address. But if you read another eight bits, you'll get what's in the next address. And so that actually turns out to be kind of convenient for reading some of these uh, you know, temperature or pressure or whatever, because you can put in, you know, I want to read address F7. That's the pressure, most significant bit. We read those eight bits. And if you just keep reading, the next eight bits you'll get is the pressure least significant byte. And then if you keep reading, you'll get these additional bits here for this X LSB, which overall will let you get all of the, uh, the bits for the pressure. So that's just kind of a convenient shortcut that they give you. So anyway, let's hook this up and uh, see it working. So I've hooked this temperature sensor up to the 6502 computer and it's a pretty straightforward connection. So we've got power and ground coming in here and that's five volts. And the, the rest of these components on this board are actually there to convert from five volts to 3.3 volts and do level shifting for the control signals as well uh, because this is a 3.3 volt sensor and we're connecting it to a five volt system. So that's what all that other stuff is. So we got our five volts going in and we've got our four connections for the SPI interface. And those are just going into IO pins on the Versal interface adapter that's hooked up to our 6502 bus. That way we can just individually uh, toggle these pins on and off or high and low as, as we need to, to communicate with this thing. And then on the software side, I've just defined some variables here for each of those four signals that map to the particular bit that they represent. And we can just sort of or these together and, and send them out to uh, toggle those pins high or low. And there's a lot of different ways we could do this. Um, perhaps the, the best way would be to use a, a, a hardware shift register where we can actually use the hardware to generate the clock for us and do offload a lot of the work. But I'm gonna show a much more sort of brute force way something typically called bit banging, where you're individually setting each individual uh, line high and low to sort of bang out the bits one at a time. And so what you'll see here is this code is basically just loading some value into the A register and then storing that value out port A. Uh, and that'll have the effect of setting whatever bits high. So in this case, we're setting the MOSI bit high um, out port A. Uh, in this case, we're setting the clock bit and the MOSI bit high out port A. Here we're setting the MOSI bit high out port A and so on. And we can basically just do this to send a whole sequence of different bit combinations. But anyhow, we start out with uh, chip select high because that is in fact where we want to start out. And then we're setting, um, this is basically setting the, the direction. So we're saying that the chip select MOSI and clock pins are our output pins. MISO is an input pin, um, that all makes sense. And we're setting that in the data direction register. And then here we're getting into a sequence where we're starting to, we're going to basically just bit bang out a, a whole series of, of bits. And in this particular case, what I'm sending is hex D0. So it's going to be this pattern of bits, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. And the reason I'm sending that particular sequence of bits is that if we look at the, the registers, register D0 is this, uh, what they call a chip ID. And basically the way that that works is the chip ID is just always going to be hex six zero. And so this is just, you know, a basic consistency check. If you just want to verify that this device is, is there, it's operating. This is kind of your simplest way of, of communicating with it is we read register D zero and we should get back six zero. And that's just always what that chip ID is set to. And so if we walk through this code, you'll see how we send that. So we're starting out by setting the MOSI pin high. And when we set the MOSI pin high, we're setting everything else low. So we're, we're setting chip select low, we're setting the clock low, but MOSI is high, so that the first bit's going to be a 1. Then the next thing we do is we set clock and MOSI high. So that's basically at this point here. So chip select's still low, of course, and it's going to continue to be low. But now clock is high, and MOSI is, remains high. So that's that rising edge, and that's actually the point where we're sending that first bit. Then the next thing we do is we said uh, just MOSI. So that is going to keep MOSI high, but it's going to bring the clock low because we're not you know, explicitly setting that high. And of course, chip select remains low. And so that's kind of at this point here where MOSI is high, but everything else is low. And the reason MOSI is high is because the second bit we want to send is also going to be a one. Um, so we send that out. And then the next thing is clock and MOSI are both high. And so that's going to give us this rising edge of the clock. So now we're kind of at this point where the clock is high, MOSI is high, chip select obviously still low, we're not touching that. Then the next thing we do is we send a zero, basically zero is going to say everything is low. So chip select's low, clock is low, um, and MOSI is also low. And this time MOSI is low because the bit we want to send is a zero, right? So we're sending one, one, zero, because the register we're trying to read from is D0, and that's what, what that is in uh, binary. So we send that zero out, 
Then we just set clock high, so that's gonna be the rising edge of this clock, and so now we're gonna be in this point here where chip selects low, clock is high, mostly also still low because we're, we're now sending that zero. And basically it will continue on in this, in this fashion. So we've got mostly high, and so we're sending another one, and then we're sending a zero, another zero, another zero, and another zero. And so that's the eight bits that we're sending in order to send the, the D zero, right? So it's one, one, zero, one, zero, 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 zero. So we're sending that. But then once we're done sending that, we actually want to send eight more clocks because we want to receive something, right? Because once we send those eight bits that indicate the, the register we want to read from, the controller's got to continue sending clock signals. It's got to send another eight clock signals so that on the MISO line, we can actually read the, the result or, or whatever's, you know, in this case, we can read what's in that register. So basically the next code here is just eight more clocks. So we just kind of keep reading that. And then at the very end, the last thing we do is we set chip select high and put that out port A. And so that's this final thing where chip select is now high, everything else is low, and that finishes it up. All right, so let's see it in action. I've got the code loaded up on the EEPROM here, and of course got the sensor connected here. And I've also got the, an oscilloscope connected to the four signal lines, so we can take a look at exactly what's going on there. And if we look at the oscilloscope, we can actually get it to decode uh, the serial, uh, and there's a bunch of serial protocols it supports, and SPI is one of those, so we've got SPI set up there. And then as for the signals, we can configure the, the four different signals. So clock, uh, we've got uh, set up on probe number one, and you can set a threshold of two volts. So again, yeah, SPI, there, there really isn't a standard for it, so the voltage levels aren't defined anywhere. So it kind of depends on your circuit. In this case, we're using five volt logic, so two volts is a good threshold for, uh, for a one. Uh, here we can say the clock is rising edge. MOSI, we've got set up on probe number two. MISO, we've got set up on probe number three, and chip select is on probe number four. So with all that set up, we've got our trigger set to trigger on, actually we want to trigger on the SPI, MOSI data, sure. Let's give that a try. So now if I reset this, there we go. And at this point, hopefully that looks pretty familiar to you. So the bottom here, of course, is our chip select. Oops. So that's showing, you know, the chip select goes low when we start transmitting data. And of course, the, this top one here is, is obviously our clock. So each bit we're seeing clocked out there. And then our, our MOSI, our master out, is, is this signal here. And so we can see we're sending the D0 here. And it decodes that here for us as well, so D0. And then simultaneously, when we're sending that, remember, this is bidirectional and simultaneous. So even though the, uh, the sensor you know, isn't really trying to send us anything at this point in time, it's still like that signal is going to be either high or low. It's going to be something. In this case, it happens to be high. Um, and so we're effectively receiving FF. We're receiving all ones. Um, and it just doesn't, you know, in this case, have any particular meaning. Likewise, once we're done sending the register we want to read from, we do get the result. And we can see the result is 6-0, which, of course, is exactly what the data sheet said it should be. So that verifies that we're actually communicating properly. Um, but same thing here, you know, we're sending all those zeros. Uh, and so I think it's just kind of interesting to, to realize that this is a bidirectional protocol. So at the, at the same time that we're sending the D0, we're, we're receiving FF, we just don't care. And at the same time that we're receiving the 6-0, we're also sending 0-0, zero, zero. it's just that the sensor doesn't care. So in some sense, even though the protocol is bidirectional, in this particular application, we're treating it as a, as a request response type of thing. So if we want to get fancy, we can write better software. So rather than you know banging each bit out one at a time like that, we can uh, do something where we create a loop. Uh, this is still bit banging because we're still setting the individual uh, bits one at a time. But we're but you know in this case I'm doing it in a loop. So I've got a, a routine that we can call here, and it'll take the A register and basically loop through um, all eight bits in the A register, and then you know shift each bit into the carry flag, test it, and then either set uh, MOSI low or set it high. Uh, depending on whether the next bit to send is, is a zero or a one. And then it'll toggle the clock. Um, and it'll also simultaneously take the, the bit coming in on the, on the MISO signal and you know, shift that into, the, the, into a receive buffer, basically. And then you know, we'll decrement our, our bit counter and, and go through a loop here. And then once we've gone through eight clock cycles, put the, you know, the data that we received into the A register and return from the subroutine. And so then the way, the way that we can use that is something like this, where we can we can start out by setting the the all the bits to zero. So that's going to pull the chip select low to start transmitting, uh, and then we can just put the register value into the A register we want and call that transceive uh, subroutine that we just looked at. 
And so in this case, it's going to send the 75. And if we got anything back, it would be in the A register. But in this case, we're, we're just sending. We're not, we don't need to receive. So the next thing we can do is just send something else. In this case, we're sending the uh, actual parameter that goes along with this instruction. Because this particular instruction, 75, that's writing to the config register. So this is just whatever value we want to put in the config register. So we send that. And then 74, I think, is the me uh, measurement control register. Um, and so we can send that as well as put the value that we want into that and send that. Um, and then we can bring the chip select high and send that out. Uh, and so this, very quickly, you know, we're able to send two different values to write to these two different registers to configure the, uh, the, the temperature sensor. And then uh, down here in the loop, I've got you know, some things that kind of runs a timer and, and you know, just sort of sits in this loop until the timer expires. But it, once that timer expires, um, same thing here. We send a zero out to our port, so that is going to have the effect of pulling chip select low. And then we send the FA out. And so th this part here, sending that FA, is saying we want to read from the FA register. And the FA register is the most significant byte of temperature. And then we're going to do another transceive, because each of these times we call transceive, we're going to get eight clock pulses. So this one was eight clock pulses to send the FA. This one's going to be eight clock pulses to receive the result. And once we receive that result, it'll be in the A register. So we can put that into our value uh, variable, or value plus one. So it's going to be the second, or uh, the most significant byte of that. And then we do another transceive to get another eight bytes. And this is going to read from, instead of FA, it'll be FB, because it's just going to re read the next register if we continue to send clock pulses. And we can put that in value. Um, and then this will bring, whoops, this will bring the uh, chip select line high again uh, to end the, the packet or end the transmission. Um, and at that point, we've got, you know, the, the least significant byte and most significant byte in value and value plus one. So um, I've got this print num subroutine that I made in a previous video that you can check out uh, that'll print a 16-byte number to the LCD. So we clear the screen and do that um, and then go back up into our loop. So basically, we're just going to sit in this loop and uh, read the temperature periodically and put it on the screen. So let's give that a try. So put that in there and reset, and there we go. So we're getting a value, and you know, again, this value doesn't necessarily mean anything. <laughs> we have to do some conversions because there's a, a ROM uh, inside that chip that will uh, that has some calibration data, and we have to read that out of, of different registers. And then there's some math that we can apply in order to convert this to an actual temperature. Um, but we should see it at least respond to temperature. So let's check that out. So it's what is it, 34,300? If I Put my hand on here to try to warm it up. You see the numbers are getting bigger, so that's a good sign. I've got an ice cube here. Let's see if I put that on there. Yep, the numbers uh, are they getting smaller. Yeah, I guess they're sort of getting smaller. Yeah, there it goes. Those numbers are getting smaller. I take that off. They start going up again. So it appears to be responding to temperature. And then if we look at the oscilloscope, we see um, it looks like there's some, some stuff happening here, but it's happening a lot slower. And that, of course, is because, you know, we're not sending those bits as fast as we could uh, because we're not doing that, you know, you know, stupid, simple bit banging. We've actually got that loop in there. and We've got some logic. Um, so that's slowing things down. But it doesn't matter. You know, the peripheral device here doesn't control the clock. It doesn't get any say in the clock. It has to just deal with whatever clock the, the CPU is sending it. So if this stuff takes longer, then so be it. In fact, you see here between each of these bytes, because we, um, you know, are getting that result and returning from a subroutine and then uh, potentially saving that somewhere and then calling the subroutine again, there's actually a little bit of extra delay between each set of eight bytes because there's extra code running there. And, and that's totally fine. You know, that's, that's a feature of SPI where the controller is in complete control of the, of the whole situation. And so if you look at, at what's happening here, so this is just the periodic reading of the temperature. And so FA is the a address of the, um, of the, register that, that contains the temperature. Um, and so we're sending FA. Uh, we're receiving FF at that time. And that's just because, again, that, that uh, MISO just happens to be high. It doesn't really matter. doesn't mean anything. Then you know we send another eight uh, clocks in order to get the result. And so the high order byte is 8.6. We happen to also be sending FF. doesn't really matter because the uh, temperature center isn't really going to pay any attention to that. Then we send another eight clocks to get the next register. Um, in this case, it's 2.8, 2.7, whatever it happens to be. 
And for that, it's kind of interesting to see, you know, we're sending 8.6 at the same time that we're receiving that second register. And that hasn't doesn't have any meaning. It doesn't really matter that we're sending that. The only reason we happen to be sending that is that, you know, the way that the code that I have works is that when we're sending these eight clocks and receiving this, 8.6, it just happens to wind up, it put or it it intentionally puts that in the A register. And so then when we call that transceive subroutine again, 8.6 is still in the A register. It doesn't really matter. Um, and so it just happens to send it. Again, it doesn't matter. We don't care that we're sending anything. The reason we're sending those clocks is so that we can receive uh, the next eight bits of, of register data. And so anyway, that's what allows us to read that register. And we're putting that on the screen and it appears to be measuring uh, temperature. Now, as I mentioned, if we want to actually get the temperature in some sort of useful unit, the datasheet gives us a C function that we can use to compensate. And so this function would take in the 20-bit temperature, and then it applies the, the, the calibration constants. And so we have to get those out of, there's actually six registers that hold the calibration constants for, uh, for temperature. So I won't go into all the gory details, but I've extracted those calibration values and converted this compensation function over to 6502 assembly and got it running. And so here it is, and this is what it's outputting. So it says it's uh, 25.32 or 33 degrees, which feels about right. And just as a point of comparison, I've got a multimeter here that has a temperature mode, which you can use with a thermocouple probe. So this is a you know, thermocouple that you can plug in and thermocouple just generates a very small voltage. And so the multimeter can read that and give you a temperature readout. And there it is, so 26.3. So it's close enough to the 25.37. Uh, one thing I've noticed is if I actually put this uh, probe right on the same sensor, they tend to get a little bit closer. So there it is, they're actually pretty close, 25.34, 25. well, it was 25.4, there it is, 25.4, pretty close. So obviously if I put my, my hand over here and warm this up, both of those start warming up. So it seems like it's working. Another interesting thing I noticed is that for that compensation, we needed to get all 20 bits of the temperature. So you can see I'm getting uh, now three bytes to get the 20 bits of, of data. And it's interesting to see that that last byte is, is flipping around. So, and even though the temperature is holding relatively constant at 25.66 or 65, you can see there's uh, maybe some more precision than we're actually getting. So I'm not really sure what's up with that, but just thought that was interesting. Anyway, I hope you found this video interesting. If you want more information about this particular temperature module, I've got links in the description. And of course, if you want to build your own 6502 computer, I've got kits and everything on my website, links to that in the description as well. And of course, as always, thanks to all my patrons who help make these videos possible.